Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhishen Zhang from Tianjin University. Uh, welcome to our series of virtual academic seminars to celebrate lunch on SmartMed. Uh, SmartMed is an open access, uh, is an open access journal launched by Wiley and Tianjin University. I'm one of the social editors of SmartMed. Uh, the editors in chief of SmartMed are Professor Wen Pinghu from Tianjin University and Professor Hua Zhang from the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, today, Professor Terry Oden from Northwestern University will give a talk. Uh, now, please allow me to briefly introduce Oden first. Uh, Terry Oden is John uh, Hastin Madden and uh, William Madden, a uh, chair professor of chemistry and uh, chair of the chemistry department at Northwestern University. Uh, she is an expert in designing structural nanoscale materials uh, that exhibit extraordinary size and shape dependent optical and uh, physical properties. Uh, Odon is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the Materials Research Society, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and uh, the American Society, uh, Chem uh, Chemical Society, and uh, the American Physical Society, and the Optical Society of America. Uh, select honors and awards include uh, the ISC and Centenary Prize, the ASC. A National Award in Surface Science Research Corporation, uh, TREE Award, and so on, so many. Uh, Odo was a founding chair of the Lobo Mental Nanoparticles uh, Golden Research Conference and the founding vice chair of the uh, GRC on uh, lasers in micro nano biosystems. Uh, she was an inaugural associate editor uh, for chemical science and the founding executive, uh, executive editor of ACS Photonics. Uh, her personal story of discovery was featured by ACS publications. Uh, uh, now, Odo is the editor in chief of Nile Letters. And today, Professor Terry Odo will give a talk about plasmodic nanoparticles lattices, a smart materials platform. Uh, let's welcome Professor Terry Odo, please. Thank you. And for joining me. Uh... Uh, this morning, um, I'm excited to share some uh, a system that I think is actually quite interesting and, and and promising as a as a platform, a new platform for smart materials. So I'll start out with describing some of the building blocks and then how they are put together in a way that makes responsive systems, and then ultimately how we can get these types of materials to interact. So I first want to acknowledge uh, the group from uh, two years ago, and I'll show you the most recent picture of the group when we weren't totally isolated, but just as an acknowledgement that we're still in the pandemic, although as an optimist, I think we're getting closer to, closer to uh, being through it. So I thought I would start off with an introduction related to uh, smart systems whether they can be considered as controlled material systems with, with multiple generations. And this can be multiple generations of function, of structure, of hierarchy, or a combination. So for example, if we start on the, on the very left, there are different types of, of building blocks. There are nanoparticles, there are molecules, and you can see that they are responsive to different types of external inputs related to, to light, related to, to magnetism. So intrinsically, they have their own type of uh, response. Once these building blocks are assembled, they can now function as a, as a system, uh, a system that is responsive in different ways. And for example, in, in, the, in the bottom, you can see that the systems can, the pillars can be upright or the pillars can be folded over depending upon the stimulus. Uh, in this uh, image here of these one dimensional lines, you can see that the lines can be uh, stretched in an applied strain or be close uh, together. So these are how they're responsive. But then ultimately you want more than just a one way uh, response. You would like the response to be two ways, which usually requires at least two different stimuli or even uh, interacting pairwise in a trimeric system. And so this is where we start to think about interacting materials. And ultimately, at the end, nature is one of the smartest systems 
we're aware of that can auto-regulate and self-regulate um, uh, intrinsically. So a smart system has many uh, definitions. The one that I think is quite interesting from 2003 from the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining is a smart system has the capability to sense its environment and the effects thereof, and if truly smart, to respond to that external stimulus via an active control mechanism. So today I want to introduce you to some of these uh, building blocks and an example of how we can design a system that can respond to, um, uh, to an external stimulus with an active control based on negative feedback. So the platform that we'll be uh, discussing today are these plasmonic nanoparticle lattices. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a portion of the space space that these lattices can occupy. For example, we can change the, the lattice geometry uh, from a, a super lattice or lattices of lattices, a square lattice, a uh, hexagonal lattice, even a, a mori lattice. All of these particles can be assembled or fabricated into these types of symmetries. We can change the unit cell shape. These are cylindrical particles in, in two dimensions. These are rhombohedral particles. And we can even change uh, their types of materials. Uh, and so there's a range of silver, gold, copper, platinum, palladium, and even hybrid materials that we'll discuss today. Okay, so once we have these, this, these fundamentals and we're carving out to this building block space, they can be put into these lattices. This is an example of a square lattice. And the square lattice can interact with metal organic framework materials and show weak and strong coupling. These types of lattices can be integrated with two-dimensional materials such as hexagonal boronitride where we can achieve enhanced emission of, uh, of quantum emitters. These are single photon uh, emission that can be enhanced. We can uh, change the local dielectric environment around these particles in a systematic way through reconfigurable imaging. And we can also interact these, combine these types of structures with gain material to achieve nanoscale uh, lasing. So I would argue that at least along these platforms, these are, um, they're responsive, but not yet smart. But we should start here as some of the building blocks. So I wanna focus on some of the properties of these plasmonic nanoparticles, the smart building blocks. So small metal nanoparticles can support what's called a localized surface plasmon when excited by light. So these uh, plasmons are collective oscillations that oscillate about a collective oscillation of electrons that oscillate about a center of mass of the particle. And if the particle is much, much smaller than the wavelength of light, then uh, you will have a dipolar excitation. And this is the dipolar ir irradiation pattern. And moreover, the because they're small metal particles, the localized field enhancements are tightly confined to, to the particle surface. So this is what makes some of these properties uh, very special. Okay, so because they're made out of metal and they support plasmons, they are very sensitive to their environment. And since they're sensitive to their environment, what that means is they can have programmable properties simply by changing the surrounding environment, both locally and in, uh, in bulk. These particles are metals. These types of programmable properties and the sensitivity to the environment also is able to be accomplished at room temperature, which is really uh, important if we're trying to think about biomimetic systems or principles of biological systems applied to smart materials. Uh, because these are metal, these particles can also show photothermal effects, meaning if you shine light on these particles, these particles will absorb the light and they can uh, transfer a portion of that light to heat, depending upon the size of the particle. And then finally, because they're based on noble metals, primarily for uh, plasmonics, they can show these catalytic effects. So we have a, a whole suite of properties that are intrinsic to the, these individual building blocks. But first we wanna start off with describing them as they're integrated into a responsive system. So if we consider one of these particles with the same dimensions and we space them out relative to each other by a photonic spacing or a diffractive spacing, what you'll notice that is a, these dipoles are now all in phase. The excitation is coherent. 
The localized fields are enhanced one to two orders of magnitude higher in the array than isolated. And you'll see based on the phase, there's a standing wave pattern. So these particles are all uh, undergoing constructive interference. Once the particles undergo constructive interference, they support a collective excitation called a surface lattice resonance or an SLR. So these surface lattice resonances have unique hybrid photonic plasmonic properties. So from the plasmonics perspective, we have high localized field enhancements, as you can see here. And then and from a photonics uh, advantage, they support high quality resonances. So you can see the individual particle localized surface plasmon is quite broad. But if we look at all of these particles into an array, they show SLR wavelengths that can approach a nanometer at, at room temperature. So that's uh, a special characteristic. So let's take a closer look at experimental data. So these are typical lattice parameters. This is a scanning electron micrograph of what these lattices look like. And then in our large area nanofabrication techniques, we can easily pattern a square centimeter all at one time. So here's an example of how these particles, both at the individual level and the collective level, are responsive to the changes in refractive index. You'll notice that at higher refractive indices, these resonances occur at longer wavelengths, both the SLR and the LSP. And then at shorter wavelengths, these are the, the more uh, blue shifted. And they uh, respond linearly to changes in refractive index. But what's also special about the system is that they can support simultaneously the collective mode as well as the localized mode. And if we were to stitch together their optical uh, spectra at different incident angles, this is what the experiment looks like, and this is the simulation, and you can see that they're in excellent uh, agreement. And at the band edge, or the k parallel equals zero, or also known as the gamma point in this square lattice, you can again see that not only is it flat banded, but these special phase and uh, high field electric field properties that I introduced earlier. Okay, so those are some of the basics of the introduction related to these uh, collective um, lattices. But what we'd like to do is describe a little bit about how we can improve some of their properties. But first, before I do that, I need to provide an overview of the way that we fabricate them. I mentioned that we use uh, a scalable fabrication uh, technique to make one, inch, one centimeter squared at a time. And this is the key feature here where we have a flexible ductile metal mask, either made out of copper or of gold, and there's holes. We can put this on any transparent or opaque substrate that we want. Once it's dried on the substrate, we can deposit material line of sight. And then we can remove this physical deposition whole array mask, either by chemical etching, scotch tape, or even using a, a, a nitrogen gun. So it's a very straightforward fabrication route. But you'll notice because we're depositing through this physical deposition mask that the particles are not all identical. They're perfectly periodic if you take the fast Fourier transform, but we would like to improve the relative uh, uniformity. So our approach was to carry out thermal annealing. And the idea was we could have these um, these cylindrical like shaped particles become uh, hemispheres or rounded particles. So we carried this out with some temperature time response. And so you can see just by comparing either the atomic force microscope images or the SEMs that now they're really very uniform over the entire area. And we can compare their crystal structure based on transmission electron micros micrographs. And these as favor cutty gold nanoparticles, the grains are small and the surface is rough, you can see here. But in the annealed particles, they're not quite single crystalline, but there are big uh, volumes, big regions of single crystalline uh, material. And you can see that the surfaces are, are smooth and these are, are beautifully shaped. You can see they're really nice uh, hemispherical shape. So how does improving the shape affect their optical properties? So we can see these two resonances again, the localized uh, surface plasmon and the SLR. And you see for that, the cylindrical particles, the shape is rather uh, uh, broad and not very intense. But for these uh, dome-like particles, the shape 
of the resonance narrows up uh, considerably and it's very sharp and it maintains it after a month. The same trend can be held, is held for silver nanoparticle lattices. Again, the, the temperatures are such that there's a uh, melting and then reshaping, and then the particles are stable for uh, up to a month at least. And this is without special uh, considerations for protecting against the oxide. We can also anneal aluminum nanoparticle lattices. You'll notice that the, the resonance quality increases. This is likely because of uh, internal, internally, uh, internal changes. Uh, the grains increase in, in size, all, so there's less uh, in scattering per particle, but the shape remains mostly the same. But another uh, plasmonic material, which is quite interesting, is, is copper, because not only does it have properties very similar to gold, but it also is a catalytic material. And one of the drawbacks of copper, however, at least for their optical properties, is surface oxidation. This is a localized surface plasmon of this particle shape. You can see it looks really nice when it's taken immediately out of the evaporator, but then only, even after uh, a couple of minutes, the resonance has redshifted and, and broadened, it's deteriorated. So this is a disadvantage of, of copper. But an advantage of copper that could potentially uh, suppress some of this copper surface oxidation is that the copper can act as a catalyst for uh, graphene growth. And there's some very uh, elegant work based on using starting materials with, with hydrogen and, and methane to be able to grow these uh, very nice sheets of few layer graphene on these copper foils. So we use these uh, starting recipes as inspiration for our own chemical vapor deposition setup. We use methane as a carbon source, hydrogen as a reductant to, to remove any copper oxide and to activate surface bound carbon and also to etch uh, and control the sizes of the, the domains. I should note that we operated uh, the reaction at a relatively high pressure, at least for, for copper uh, in this type of uh, graphene growth. So we don't um, eliminate all of our copper source at too high a temperatures because of course we're growing on individual particles and not growing on a foil. So this is a comparison to these as deposited or as fabricated copper lattices. Once they've undergone the CVD growth of the graphene, they're just really very beautiful. They're uniform in, in shape and in size. Uh, again, they have this dome-like shape and the smooth and uh, surface. If we evaluate their transmission electron microscope images, you see there's a uh, few layer graphene that's conformal to the surface. And then if we investigate the XPS spectrum, you see that there's very uh, little uh, copper oxide. That's these little peaks if you squint a little bit, even after a month. So the, the few layer graphene that is conformal to the um, copper particle surface also is a very good protector of the um, against copper uh, oxidation. If we compare the properties of these as fabricated copper and these uh, copper nanoparticles coated with graphene, you'll see that it's quite uh, narrow. Some of the narrowest that we've ever uh, realized in these systems and at, again, again at room temperature. Okay, so these are the building blocks that we're thinking about relating to building uh, responsive uh, systems. So the first one that I want to introduce is related to nanoscale lasing. Um, so the reason why plasmonic nanoparticles are, are special, and these are all different platforms, is that they can beat the diffraction limit, meaning you can squeeze the light into volumes that are much, much less than would be allowed by uh, diffraction. And so these are these some quintessential uh, platforms based on these very large gain material uh, where the plasmons are squeezed in between. But I wanna introduce uh, this type of system, these nanoparticle arrays, because I think they offer more opportunity for reconfigurability for responsiveness, and also they can operate at room temperature. So this is the, the system uh, of interest where we have the particles patterned on, on glass, and then they're surrounded by a gain material, in this case, IR140, which is a lasing dye. 
This dye can be distributed in polymer or in organic solvents. The, uh, the excitation source pumps and excites the, the dye molecules who then transfer their energy to the nanoparticle lattice. So this is the SLR mode that I introduced uh, earlier. This is the photoluminescence of the gain bandwidth and we achieve nanoscale lasing at the same position as the SLR wavelength, which means that if we can shift the wavelength anywhere within this photoluminescence bandwidth, you can easily tune the lasing wavelength. So this system is special in that there's single mode emission. You don't have a lot of different types of lasing peaks. The reason for this is we have a high local optical density of states at the band edge mode. Uh, and this is from uh, lasing from the gamma point. These line widths are, are very narrow. There's a clear threshold with nonlinear increase in intensity. And for the first time, we were able to achieve uh, directional beams. Most of the previous results, everything was in plane, but if you're trying to take advantage of a coherent light source, you'd like to be able to manipulate the direction that the light comes out. And then finally, something, uh, an attribute that I think is, is really uh, very interesting is that the, the mechanism of, of lasing, this is this deep subwave like mechanism that beats the diffraction constraints, is that only the molecules that are excited very close to the particle surface contribute to lasing action. This is a stimulated emission map solved uh, with a semi-quantum model. And only in these hotspot regions are, are, are the molecules experiencing high fields and whose properties are being amplified. And so if we now test this with um, these uh, graphene-coated copper nanoparticles, you'll see that the SLR wavelength is very narrow, about two nanometers. And then again, we just need to overlap it with the photoluminescence of the gain bandwidth. And now the nanolasing uh, signal is quite narrow. 0.2 uh, nanometers. And it's likely much less than this. This is just the limit of our spectrometer. Uh, we see you know, really nice uh, lasing emission. These are the beams. And there's uh, distinct advantages by improving the quality of the building block in terms of almost a five times order of magnitude, sorry, five times, not order of magnitude, five times the uh, the line width of the, of the lasing and uh, increased nonlinearity in the properties. So how are, how do these, can we make these lasing systems uh, responsive? How can we make them uh, smart? Well, at least uh, on the way towards that in, in making responsive um, nanoscale lasers is to pattern these nanoparticles on an elastomeric stretchable substrate such as polydimethyl siloxane. So as you mechanically strain uh, the system, you're increasing the separation between the particles. And because the gain is solubilized in a solvent, you will always be able to have gain molecules directly around the particles, which is really uh, quite nice. You will never deplete the amount of uh, gain in, in the hotspots. And you can see this here, and this is a, a, a small uh, applied strain. And as you increase the separation between the particles, you get this uh, shift in the, the wavelength. And then as you release the, the strained, uh, mechanically strained substrate to its original um, unstretched state, then we achieve the, the wavelength that we expect, uh, that we started with. So it's a really nice way for the system to be uh, responsive in this mechanical way. Another uh, example of responsiveness is to achieve dynamically tunable lasing. So we integrate the system with a microfluidic channel and so now the separation between the particles remains the same. And we just flow in different refractive index environments with the same dye. And so you can see a uh, shifting between these two different um, wavelengths. Um, and these are just bubbles. Uh, um, the reason they jump is because there are different bubbles of uh, the low index and the high index uh, material, but it works uh, quite, quite nicely. Um, so this is all responsive to the environment. Um, another way that these uh, systems can be designed to be responsive uh, 
remember, is, uh, is by a different type of stimuli, and this relates to anisotropic shape, and in this case, the responsive to uh, polarization. So we can describe, we can design these interesting low symmetry types of lattices. This is a aluminum nanoparticle lattice that has this uh, rhombohedral type uh, shape. And in this case, there are two different SLR modes, one corresponding to uh, uh, a lower diffractive order and one to a higher diffractive order. And if we evaluate the phase at the short wavelength and long wavelength, you would see as expected, um, we have these standing wave patterns against which whichever axis is the, the high symmetry axis. So this all makes uh, sense. But what's interesting is that uh, the hotspots, however, are at the same locations for the rhombohedral particles. So at the short wavelength corresponding to this SLR and at this longer wavelength corresponding to this, uh, to this SLR, you'll notice that the localized hotspots are spatially overlapped. They're in the exact same position. And we get this type of interesting response because of asymmetry, because we don't see this in these uh, cylindrical particles or, or circles uh, in the 2D um, top down, where in this case, if you change, if you're looking at uh, what these shorter or longer wavelength residences, they follow the fields as you might expect. So in this case, for these anisotropic particles, we can localize these same hotspots, but they occur at different wavelengths. It's a very interesting system. So in this case now, then we're able to achieve uh, dual balloon lasing from these two SLRs. So these are the same hotspots again, but then there are different molecules that are coupling to these hotspots. And so you can see this here, this is the photoluminescence, and then these are the, the lasing uh, signatures. If we look at their input output curves, they're, they're roughly the same. And then if we compare the, the simulated spectra, and these are these uh, stimulated emission rate maps, you can see that if the polarization is uh, along this direction, that we're only exciting molecules that are here. And the wavelength is at bluer wavelengths. If we uh, have a polarization that goes uh, along this direction, you'll see again that the hot spots are still in these same locations. And then we achieve blue emission, sorry, longer wavelength emission. And if you're at a polarization that or polarization angle that's in between, then you can access both. So this is quite interesting, which we can now start to take advantage of uh, a plasmonic response related to symmetry because they are now responsive to polarization. And finally, related to, to lasing, we'd like to think about um, increasing the, the system level uh, properties. So in this case, instead of a, a single lattice, we've combined two lattices in a sandwich-like structure. And we'd like to design the system in such a way to achieve white light emission. So our approach has been to use aluminum nanoparticle lattices. So we have a, a longer wavelength lattice, uh, 450 nanometers. And so we're able to achieve uh, a redder wavelength SLR and a bluer wavelength SLR from higher order. If we reduce the lattice spacing to 350 nanometers, we're able to achieve an SLR that's in between this blue and this red uh, SLR in the larger lattice spacing uh, system. So then we can combine these uh, arrays with different um, molecular dyes. And these uh, concentrations are empirically uh, determined. But for example, if we combine this 450 nanometer lattice with C480, we achieve uh, blue emission. If we combine a 450 nanometer lattice with DCM, we achieve red emission. And if we combine this 350 nanometer lattice with C500, we can achieve green emission. And so then you can imagine, you can start uh, combining uh, these types of dyes that are soluble all in DMSO. And just by changing uh, the ratio of these um, different dye molecules, we can uh, control the intensity at the wavelength that they uh, emit. So in this case, most of the uh, lasing response uh, is at 
longer wavelengths. And in this case now, it's at shorter wavelengths and at intermediate ratios, it's in between. And so you can see that these two emit uh, normal to the surface and you have these uh, funny uh, beam shapes, although they overlap in the center, partly because one's from a higher order mode and a, one's from a lower order mode, but they're still all at the gamma point. We can also uh, sandwich the uh, lattices together, in this case, uh, without dye. So we can evaluate what the optical properties look like first. And you'll notice that regardless of the in-plane uh, rotation, uh, we can support, or these lattices support three different distinct resonances. And then if we look at their uh, photonic band diagram, we can identify all of these uh, flat bands corresponding to the gamma point in these lattices. We can then uh, combine different combinations of these dyes uh, together. So if we combine DCM and, and C500, again, we can control the relative ratios. So at a, at a higher ratio of C500, it corresponds to longer wavelength emission. And at a reduced uh, ratio, then we can achieve shorter wavelength emission, about an orange color. Similarly, if we combine C480 with C500, again, we're just changing these ratios, volume ratios empirically, and you can control the, the amplitude uh, or the intensity of these different uh, colors, which is pretty nice. And so we can uh, put all of these different uh, wavelengths on a CIE uh, plot, and we're able to achieve uh, white light uh, emission with this particular volume ratio uh, of the dyes. And if you integrate uh, this collection angle, then it corresponds to what we would anticipate for white light emission. So this is, this is really nice. It's some flexibility that we get from this type of system where all of these molecules can be solubilized in the same solvent and then just by a unique combination uh, of lattices, we have this very uh, simple system with uh, tunable properties. So where I'd like to transition now is the, the use of these nanoparticle lattices, not as a, a cavity for, um, for lasing, but as a, a thermal source for autoregulatory materials. So I want to introduce two different multi-component synthetic systems for autoregulation. These are beautiful uh, examples of making interacting systems. The first uh, system is called SMARTS for self-regulating artificial material system. <clears throat> and each of these uh, multi-component systems, they have a, a sensor and they have a regulator, something that they will detect and then something that will uh, actuate or respond. And so the sensor in this case is a temperature sensitive mechanical uh, actuation from a, a polynepom polymer. And then the regulator uh, is heating from an exothermic uh, chemical reaction. So you can see um, this, this feedback loop on whether uh, the materials are being heated up and then the gel is going to swell or if the system has now uh, uh, reducing in temperature and the heat is off, which is making the, the catalyst uh, bend over. It's a very nice uh, feedback uh, loop system, negative feedback. Another uh, really beautiful system is one that's a uh, self-adjusting uh, response to heat and, and humidity. They're based on these um, carbon nanotube uh, yarns that are bundled together and the carbon nanotubes can uh, absorb light and respond. And as they absorb light and respond, it will, it will change um, the, the, how close or how tight together the, the carbon nanotubes um, are if they're wet. So in this case, the sensor is a humidity, a responsive mechanical actuation from a bimorph polymer. And then the regulator is the heating from, from the carbon nanotubes because of course the na carbon nanotubes can absorb uh, infrared uh, light. And these uh, materials are, or these autoregulatory materials are to be able to compensate for changes in, in, in body temperature. So what are some design uh, principles of these uh, smart materials? So I mentioned earlier that 
in the very beginning of Envision Expert Materials, mostly it was just a response. You stimulate A and you produce response uh, B. Um, but as we increase in sophistication, there are two-way systems, which typically requires two external uh, stimuli. So for example, this is a, a, a cartoon where the person looks uh, relaxed. Um, however, if their body temperature uh, increases, they will start uh, sweating. And so in order to, which will activate a, a cooling process to uh, eliminate all of this heat. After this cooling process occurs based on sweating, the body temperature decreases and then uh, a very comfortable temperature is reached. Similarly, if the body temperature decreases, then uh, a heating process is activated as the person is shivering. As the person is, is shivering, this uh, motion will increase the, the body uh, temperature. And so the temperature increases. And so now we're, uh, the person is uh, again at a comfortable temperature. So these are very similar um, big processes uh, that uh, some of these artificial ones want to, to mimic. And so the, the key idea here is uh, one of self-regulation. So it's the ability to negate perturbations to the system by internal mechanisms without requiring another external intervention. And so this then requires a, a negative feedback loop. So always return so that, that the system can adjust to a change to get back to the original um, uh, set point. So the system that we have uh, focused on is this uh, multi-component self-regulatory uh, system where what we're interested in is uh, responding to external uh, moisture, which is going to be regulated by system-induced heating. So the components are, we again have a sensor and we have a regulator. And the sensor is going to be a, a wrinkled hydrogel that will detect moisture changes. And the regulator will be this metal nanoparticle lattice for uh, photothermal or plasmonic heating. So these are the components of, of the system. So the idea is there's a change. Uh, we start off in this state. There's a change in, in moisture. So the, the hydrogel is going to swell. As the hydrogel swells, the wrinkles, uh, they, they flatten out. Once the wrinkles flatten out, there is less light scattered. So here the light is scattered. Once they're flat, there's less light scattered and then more light is transmitted. And so as more light is, is transmitted, the nanoparticles can then absorb the light and they can convert that absorbed light uh, into heat. And that uh, the actuation that happens is then the, hydro whoops, is the hydrogel uh, loses uh, its water. So the moisture uh, evaporates and then uh, we achieve this uh, wrinkled state uh, again. And then once we're in the wrinkled state, there's no more heat because all the uh, light is again being scattered. And so this is a, a, a cycle uh, that can be um, uh, interrupted, but also controlled at every single stage. So let's see how this works. So this is the, the hydrogel that we use with this polyacrylamide uh, hydrogel. You can see um, some of these uh, properties here. Um, these are some characteristics in the dry state uh, and the wet state. You can see this is the size and the dry state, and you can see the, the swelling uh, uh, ratio when it's fully uh, hydrated. Um, on these, uh, on these uh, systems, then we ha also have a, a fluoropolymer layer because we need it's transparent. Uh, higher Young's modulus than the, the, the hydrogel because we need to be able to have a stiffer skin layer that can create the wrinkles. And so we can characterize the, the dynamics of these wrinkle patterns and how their degree of wetness affects their roughness. So for example, if the system is completely dry, we have these uh, wrinkles. If they've been wet for about five minutes, you can see that they, they flatten out and the roughness factor goes from about uh, 750 to about uh, a little less than, than 200. As uh, we're drying the system, 
This is drying after uh, eight minutes. You can see that the roughness or the wrinkles start to form. After 13 minutes, they form more, 18 minutes. Again, they uh, become uh, rougher. And then after uh, 26 minutes, then they're almost the same as in the original dried state. And so this is how you can see this plot out here. It's very rough in the dry state. It's very little roughness, or they mostly become flat at the, at the wet state. And then as we're drying it, then we can get these increased uh, roughness. And uh, we can estimate the, the time scale and calibrate this for, for wetting and drying. And then the amount of roughness is tunable by changing the hydrogel modulus, the cross-linking density, uh, or the fluoropolymer skin thickness. So we then wanted to characterize the hydration and dehydration cycles of the wrinkled uh, hydrogels. So first, we wanted to compare the effects of pattern and, and non-pattern. And so if we just have the hydrogel that's, uh, that's wet. I mean, so we start dry and then we wet it and then uh, we dry it again. You'll notice that the transmittance doesn't change. It's very transparent. However, once these um, hydrogels are, are wrinkled, when they start off uh, dry, you can see the orange curve here. The transmittance is, is very low, only 10% because there's a lot of light scattering. Uh, once we've wet the system, you'll notice that the transmittance increases to about 70%. So again, more light is now transmitted uh, through the hydrogel. Uh, when we uh, dried it for 15 minutes, you can see that that transmittance is in between uh, the, two, the, the ranges. And then when it's all dry, then it uh, goes back to its original uh, wrinkle, uh, wrinkle shape. And then again, we can wet it again, then it goes back to uh, very high transmittance. So this is what um, um, these photographs look like when the, the wrinkles are, are flattened. This is in the wet state, and then whether they're dry, so you can see visually what this uh, optical transmittance corresponds to. Um, in order to achieve, uh, the wrinkles can be hydrated pretty uh, quickly, but the dehydration is much uh, uh, slower, but it can be accelerated by, by heating. But it takes uh, overnight to get back to the fully wrinkled state. Um, and so you can uh, see this here in terms of the transmittance from going from 20% uh, to 75% in these, uh, in these types of cycles. What we then wanted to do is evaluate the photothermal uh, heating effects from these plasmonic uh, lattices. So we used uh, 808 nanometer, uh, uh, a laser at 880 nanometers because this is the wavelength of the SLR. And so you can see that if we compare from the blank substrate to a gold film of the same thickness to the, the nanoparticle array that the SLR enhances optical absorption compared to the gold. You'll notice that this is an array and there's much less uh, gold present on, on the surface, but you can compare the increase in temperature up to 46 degrees compared to 28 degrees. So this is again, uh, an effect of this collective uh, resonance. We can control the temperature increase by controlling the nanoparticle size. So the optimal size is that uh, 46.4 uh, nanometers. This is in the bottom, uh, uh, depth of the SLR resonance. If we make a bad SLRs or we detune away from the optimum, you'll notice that if we detune to the right, we get a decrease. If we start detuning to the left, we again um, get a significant decrease. So it's really uh, corresponding to uh, maximum absorption at the SLR wavelength. The amount of temperature increase also depends on the, the substrate material. So for example, if we compare these uh, thermal uh, coefficients of glass polystyrene and quartz, you can see on the polystyrene, we're able to achieve uh, temperatures up to almost 85 uh, degrees when these nanoparticle arrays are on this particular substrate, compared to glass, which is less, and quartz, which is even less. And this all corresponds with the thermal coefficients. But this is now a, a, a way to easily tune the temperature response that we want either by changing the nanoparticle size or by changing the, the substrate material. And so what we think is quite special about this uh, programmable self-regulation system is that these cycles can be manipulated in two distinct ways. One is the absolute amount of temperature can um, 
that can be modulated, but also the, the time scales at which it occurs can also be modulated. So for some things, like if we were using this type of system for drug release, you might like this red curve, these bottom curves where you don't need a lot of temperature to change the, the system and you have a very slow uh, time release based on um, what is required for, for that uh, biological system. In other cases, we might want the response to be much uh, faster. For example, if we have fast release fertilizers or other types of uh, systems, um, that would benefit from um, faster manipulation. And that could also withstand these higher types of temperatures. But this is just, I think, the beginning of the phase space that we can start to explore in this uh, smart system. Okay, so I'd like to, to just finish with um, some um, another application of these reconfigurable materials, and that's related to, to, to lattice lenses in about 42 minutes. Uh, right now, so I won't spend too much time on it, but I do think it's interesting to show the breadth of possibilities that this simple platform enables. So there have been several strategies to achieve reconfigurable flat lenses. One of them is you might expect you put these nanoparticles uh, on uh, PDMS and then you just stretch it. And so one advantage is you have this dy dynamic uh, system. Uh, a disadvantage is it likes lacks element-wise control, the whole system changes. Um, there's also this approach using phase change materials, which overcomes this element-wise control for tuning at the single unit level. But the challenge with uh, this type of, of system is that it's diffraction limited because you have light that's incident via an objective. It's non-scalable and it's serial, but it's also limited to infrared uh, wavelengths. And so for some applications, yes, you want to image, you can see these are the focal spots here, going corresponding to here and two corresponding to here. But in other times you would like to be able to image invisible wavelengths. So the idea we had was uh, what we call uh, lattice lenses where the optical properties would be given by the size of the lens and the transmission at each point in the array. So we wanted to create a grid. And it's a grid, a two dimensional grid of holes or of particles. But the challenge is even in a 10 by 10 uh, grid, there are near infinite possibilities for, for focusing. And so it's a design challenge where if we were to just brute force do these calculations just for a single focal point, it would take beyond the age of the universe, significantly beyond the age. So I had a, a, a really a spectacular student who was interested, he said, well, Maybe we can use machine learning approaches or genetic algorithm approaches. So the idea is you convert this to binary. So whether you have a hole uh, that's one or if it's closed, it's a zero. And then now if in a 10 by 10 micron area, you have a DNA which corresponds to a single DNA strand, which is uh, 1089 uh, bases long. And so he developed this evolutionary uh, algorithm. I won't go through all the details, but it's you have a, a, a member uh, population, you need to evaluate the fitness at a certain point, you need to uh, introduce mutations and you also need to create uh, mixed generations. And then once uh, uh, this has converged, then uh, you'll have your uh, solution. So we first uh, applied this system to holes, then we just applied it to, to nanoparticles where again, these gold nanoparticles are the, the building blocks and as you know by now, these localized plasma resonances will define the operating uh, wavelengths. And then the optical responses will be tuned by the arrangement of the particles. And so we use finite difference time domain simulations because we needed to have real materials and change the nanoparticle shapes. And then we use this inverse uh, design approach, which is a, a black box approach, but it also includes multi-objective optimization meaning if we want just a single point, focal point, that's just a single objective optimization. But if you want multiple level focusing or different color wavelength imaging at different colors, then you need multi-objective. And so then we, again, use this uh, genetic algorithm, and this is a nanoparticle lattice that can uh, image at a certain focal distance at three different wavelengths. And these different wavelengths are defined by the localized plasma resonance of the, the particles. And again, you notice that some of them are, are elongated, so you can take example advantage of asymmetry.
But in terms of having particles that are all the same, we start off with a uniform lattice. We can take advantage of these strongly coupled nanoparticles um, and we can control the, the wavefront by changing the local environment around the, the particles. So for example, this is sort of similar, but a different way to the smart uh, regulatory uh, material introduced with a hydrogel. If we have PMMA uh, on top, uh, the, the light is gonna be trapped. It's gonna be scattered uh, in plane because that's what these lattices are really good at doing. However, if you just have air on top, the light's just going to be uh, transmitted because there's it's not in a good index environment to, to trap the light. So it'll just go completely through the sample. And so then we can uh, make these lattices starting uh, randomly and getting into what we might expect a Fresnel lens type structure for a single uh, uh, wavelength focal point. So we first tested this with uh, this is PMA on, on some of the uh, nanoparticle arrays. And we're able to achieve a uh, single wavelength uh, focusing at five microns away from the substrate or 10 microns away from the substrate. And you can see what the different uh, patterns look like. We're able to achieve a multifocal point uh, lensing by uh, patterning the substrate. This is uh, two focal points. Uh, these are three uh, focal points. And you can see uh, there's some correlation maybe to, to what it might expect, but the genetic algorithm still helps us out a lot here. Uh, we can achieve uh, three focal points in the same plane, seven microns from, from the substrate. And we can even achieve uh, five different focal points in the same plane, nine microns from the substrate. So it works uh, quite nicely just to manipulate the dielectric environment around the particles. But then what we'd like to do is to make this reconfigurable. So those are single uh, pattern substrates. And so we introduced this idea of uh, solvent-assisted nanoscale embossing, what we call SANE. We have a, a template uh, based on a, um, we have a, a silicon template where each of these corresponds to a different pattern of, of lenses, but then we can convert this into PDMS so that we can then pattern the, the resist. So once we, um, have uh, PDMS mask with these different patterns from the silicon uh, substrate, then we can spin coat SU8 on these silver nanoparticle lattices and use SANE to generate these uh, arrays of, of metal lenses. And this is quite nice. You have these uh, arrays of, of metal lenses. These are these four focal point lenses. You have one mask. This is mask one. It has its pattern with three uh, focal point lenses. You wet this mask with the solvent put it on top of this pattern four focal point lens, and then you take all this material and you just rearrange it. And then you rearrange this material and now we have uh, these uh, three focal point lenses. Similarly, we can take this three focal point lens pa whoops, pattern, have another uh, mask with a four focal point lens and it goes back. You've just, there's no material loss, you're just redissolving and remolding the material, which is quite nice. So you can see this here. These are what the, the substrates look like. And underneath them, you can see what the uh, pattern and, uh, patterns, uh, image patterns look like. And you see that they're very uniform in intensity. Uh, we can uh, evaluate these uh, lattices for uh, imaging. And so this is now our, uh, our object. And the image formed uh, looks, uh, looks quite clear. And then we can also uh, test the, uh, this is still, this is limited by diffraction, um, a multi-scale object and what the image then uh, looks like. And then finally, we're able to achieve uh, on-demand uh, image tuning. So we have one focal point uh, here. We can then do SANE and then remold uh, two focal points. And then we can do SANE again, take this and get four focal points. And these are the full four, focal points formed, and these are the four images formed. So it all matches really, really nicely. It's this beautiful reconfigurable uh, aspect. Okay, so in summary, um, I tried to introduce this nanoparticle lattice as a smart uh, materials platform. These building blocks can be both catalytic as well as uh, plasmonic. Their surface chemistry can be uh, readily controlled. They're responsive to stimuli such as light, changes to the environment, as well as polarization, depending upon the nanoparticle shape. And in terms of these applications, I showed you some examples of white light uh, emission, 
uh, photothermal temperature control for autoregulatory materials, and then reconfigurable imaging with uh, flat lenses. And so um, I'd like to finally acknowledge the, the group. This is a, a photo taken just a couple of, of months ago where it's a beautiful uh, fall day. And I thank you for um, listening to, to my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, Professor Aldon. So uh, thanks very much for your one for our talk. So I'm Cao Liang from uh, City University of Hong Kong. So I will host the Q, QA section. So our staff have collected some questions from different living platforms, such as Bilibili, YouTube, Facebook, or, and so on. So I will ask her the questions on the behalf of the audience. So, uh, so the first question is, so as you mentioned in your talk that, that you, you use the Soplatis uh, uh, nanoparticles mm -hmm. um, to use for the lasers, right? You mentioned you, you can confine the, you can achieve the very nano emissions by, by using the uh, molecule Dye molecules because dye molecule originally it has a very broad emissions, but when you use the your uh, your your this subalatis nanoparticles, you can get a very nano emission. Like I think it's less than one nanometers. So, could you please explain uh, why uh, what's the mechanism behind this? Oh yes, okay. Uh, well, let me explain the mechanism first related to the individual nanoparticle and the lattice because that's that affects the properties for lasing. Mm -hmm. So most of the uh, most single metal nanoparticles, they have very broad localized surface plasmon resonances. They're on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers in, in width. And the reason for that is a combination of scattering, uh, absorption, all sorts of competing effects that contribute to loss. Um, if we take that same nanoparticle, and we put it into the appropriately designed array. We're now taking that nanoparticle and coupling it to uh, a very good photonic mode. And so the, the hybridization of these is, uh, uh, it's like a surface plasmon, um, it's, like a, it's a, more like a polariton. It's a mix of the, the plasmon and the photon. And so the reason that the lattices have their narrow, narrow line widths is because they trap all the light in the plane. So they can still scatter light, but because they trap all the light in the plane, you don't lose as much light based on all of these scattering characteristics. And mm -hmm. so that's why there's the, 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 the photon, if you will, stays for a long time in the, in the particle plane. So for example, the, the lifetime of the um, nanoparticles are on the orders of tens of femtoseconds on average for single metal particles. But in the lattice, the, the lifetime of the lattice is on the order of 10 picoseconds. So it's much, much longer because it's able to be trapped in the in the array. Okay. And so that yeah. will affect what you get for the for the lasing effects. Yeah, that's very interesting. So the second question is, you mentioned by you tune the string of the subject, you can tune the wavelengths, emission wavelengths of the lasers, right? Yes. So could you please also explain uh, the, the working mechanism behind these phenomena? Yes. So, um, so as we increase the strain on, on a soft substrate, we're increasing the separation of the particles. And so as of the, in the lattice, so as we're increasing the separation between the, the nanoparticles, they are, uh, that will naturally shift the SLR wavelength. So the SLR wavelength is proportional to the separation between the nanoparticles and the lattice. So that's why when we apply strain and we increase the separation of the particles, then the SLR shifts. And as long as the SLR shifts and stays within the gain bandwidth of the dye, then you can just shift it nicely forward and, and back. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your uh, answers. Uh, I think that's so far the questions from the audience. Uh, although there are a lot of people actually watching this, your talk, but but seems like uh, only uh, a few questions from, from okay. them. So, okay. uh, uh, so, so I, I will ask a question actually uh, not related to your talk. So because uh, 
smart matter, the new journals, uh, we are trying to uh, find a way, good way to improve its impact. So since, since, you, since you are the chief leader of Narlatas, as we know, Narlatas is a very impactful international journal. So maybe, uh, maybe do you uh, have any suggestions that how we can uh, impact, improve the impact of uh, this new, newly launched journals? Get some, some uh, yeah. suggestions. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you what we're doing right now. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> uh, um, part, part of it is it's a, it's, it's a twofold combination. So what I've seen with recent, uh, recently launched journals by Cell Press and, you know, there's just a bunch, Wiley, yes. Nature X, there's just, there's just too yes, many, yes, yes. Um, is that you need to recruit a couple of articles from big Nobel Prize type people. Yes. Okay, that, that's one thing. That's I've, I've noticed. The second thing I think is is playing the long game, which is what uh, I am working on right now, is to invest in young scientists. So how do you get the earliest people, meaning PhD students, how do you get PhD students interested in your journal? Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, so we're starting, uh, I, I can't announce the, outreach program yet, but I think it's very exciting because we haven't launched it yet, but it's soon. Um, and I think investment in PhD students and then moving up will make a big difference um, yes. for the long game, for the longevity, because this is what has been true for, for nano letters. I mean, I was a graduate student when the journal was launched and, uh, and, you know, I had my my when I was actually when I was a P, when I was at my as an assistant professor, my first paper was published in, in Nano Letters, and I remember that experience. And so, and then you just grow up with the journal. If you can invite as many people as you can to grow up with Smart Mat, that will pay off in in the long run. But it's a lot of investment. You have to play the long game, right? So, yes, yes. <laughs> students are the long game because they will grow up and become famous professors. But to get started, you know, you need like the Nobel Prize type people to uh, to uh, contribute research articles to to the journal and that will make a difference. Okay, yes, but thanks it's all very about much people. for you. It's, yeah, it's I think this, yeah, yes, this is a very good uh, suggestion actually. I think uh, it's not just like a uh, part of papers from um, famous people, but also get the, that the, the, the PhD students who are really doing experiment to, to read your papers, then, then that's also very, very, mm -hmm. a very good way, actually. Also, like, as you mentioned, it's a very long term way. Then, once they, mm -hmm. they become a professor, then they will still remember at the beginning. They the, will. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, very good suggestion. We will try to follow your suggestions. <laughs> so, yeah, I think since we don't have any more questions from audience, so I think we, we will end the. Uh, that this uh, today's okay. presentation here. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay.